wonderful memoir. Yeah, mine. 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 Yo. She. I lion. She. She. Come on. She. That's what she. Break it down. You know, I um, lived a bit of a checkered past back in those years. <clears throat> and um, you know, I lived in Waikiki for a while, and then I moved out to the beach. Lived on the beach um, where I built a shack. Um, I had a lot of stories from that one, but that's not what I'm going to talk about because from there, I moved to Colorado. And uh, I lived in an abandoned sawmill way out in the middle of nowhere. And um, unfortunately, I spent the entire winter by myself, which is not a good idea with this head. And um, I was about 23 or 24. And, um, and I had this, it was a, this skeletal barn. There was a chicken coop over here. And, and, but the house was surprisingly warm. And, uh, and I lived in that house by myself. Well, my closest neighbors were the Fitzgeralds, and they were good friends of mine, and they lived two miles beyond me, a little higher up, uh, right up against the, um, the National Forest, and they had a beautiful place, but none of us had any utilities at all. There was no electricity, um, no water, um, no phones. What else do we have? Uh, heating, no heating, so we had to, you know, it was very subsistence level living. Um, and there was a county road that came right up to where I lived, and then during the winter there was so much snow that the Fitzgeralds would park their car at my house and then ride their horses up to the next two miles to their house. Well, what was really neat about it was uh, they also had a sleigh. And this particular morning I was standing out on my porch drinking some hot coffee and it was really cold out. But um, I needed to talk to them that morning and, <clears throat> and I could hear the sleigh coming, coming down the little road. and. Um, along the, the ice and the snow, and, and there was a, a, just like you'd want there to be, there was a string of, of jingle bells on the sleigh, or, um, pulled by a white horse. So here they come, here's Jim Fitzgerald, the father, who's about maybe 10 years older than me, and his twin daughters, um, Gretchen and Janine, and who they're both eight. And, uh, and, there's, and the girls are riding, the girls actually taught me how to drive the sleigh, it was, it was a wonderful experience. So. Um, they came down, pulled into my yard, and I went over to the sleigh and uh, helped the girls out. And I said, why don't you guys run inside and hang out with the cats for a few minutes? I made some hot chocolate. Go drink some hot chocolate, and I'll, um, I'll unhitch the horse with your dad here. And they were delighted at this, so they ran inside, said hi to my rabbits on the way in. And, um, and once Jim and I were alone, I, I said, Brownie died overnight. And Brownie was Gretchen's horse. And I had gone out that morning to say hello uh, to the horses. And I had walked into the stall inside the barn and one horse was standing there very nervous and, and very upset. Mm. And the other horse was, was leaned against oh. the side of the corral. It had fallen during the night and um, it was just at an angle like that and um, was frozen stiff because it was so cold. And, um, and Jim, this was really the crux of this whole thing for me is because Jim was just this lovely, empathic man. And um, he was a guy who truly loved his daughters. And he understood them and he always talked to them and he, they talked about their feelings with him. And these were all things that I had not known in my life. My dad was an army colonel. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I grew up with this very remote man. He had been an infantry sergeant during World War II. I'm sure the experience is there. Uh, that he didn't want to talk about, but they had made him very um, insular and mm -hmm. um, and was and was cold. I mean, he was a, a nice guy, but but very remote. And um, so, um, I, w I was watching Jim, and he sat on this nail keg there in the barn, and and he's got his hands up in his hair, and he's trying to figure out what to do. And and um, I said, "What do you think we should do?" And he looked up, and there were tears in his eyes, and and I was so struck by. Because I knew that he wasn't crying for the horse. He was crying for Gretchen, his right. daughter. And it was really beautiful for me to, to witness that in a man, you know. Um, he said, well, look, he taught Spanish at uh, Fort Lewis College in Durango. He said, um, I'll drop the girls off at school. I'll call the college and tell them I can't come in today. And then I'll come back out here. And maybe you and I can figure out what to do about the horse. I wasn't going anywhere, so I said, okay. And maybe 20 minutes later, I hear his, um, his station wagon come back up this long road. And from my vantage point, you could see so far, it was this plains, um, 6,000 feet in Colorado, way off to the right were the San Juan Mountains above Durango at 14,000 feet. It was this really beautiful, beautiful place. And um, 
and like I said, we're at the end of this county road, so no other traffic was on the road. And he pulled into the yard, and um, some friends of ours, some Ute, um, some uh, Native Americans, uh, Utes had left their Jeep with us. And, um, and so we could use it whenever we needed. Well, we, it had a winch on the front. And so we pulled the Jeep in front of the barn. And Jim wrapped the cable around um, Brownie's front legs because we needed to get him out of the barn. So we engaged the winch and the cable came flying out at us. <coughs> Excuse me. And, um, and we went back inside and, and it had pulled the horse's legs, broken them in front like this. Oh. And um, uh, Could you hand me my water, please? It might be. Right here. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> and he felt terrible. And because he said, Oh my God, I'm trying to do this night. And I just broke Brownie's legs. I mean, I could tell it was just killing him. So this time we wrapped the cable around the, the whole body and it easily came out. We engaged the winch and just slid right out. And once we were out in the yard, it was all snow and ice. So it, it, it really moved like a skate. And, um, so I said, so what are we going to do? I mean, it was February, and, and it was probably about maybe 20 degrees. The sun was shining and everything, but the ground was hard as iron. Because um, it had it been a warm weather, we would have buried them. And, um, and uh, he said, well, you know, I was thinking about this. About a quarter of a mile down the road, remember there's that real steep bank, and it goes down about maybe 15, 18 feet. And I thought maybe if we could slide him over the bank and he'll slide down there, and people won't notice him. There's some brush around there. So let's do it. So we pulled uh, Brownie down the road, and this is a really odd scene, you know, of the, of the Jeep pulling this horse, and I'm trying to keep the horse on the road, and it's sliding all over the place. And <coughs> so we get to this place, unhook uh, the cable, and then try to push the horse to the edge, and it's 1,500 pounds of, of dead weight, and it took everything we had, even on the ice. We would just rah, maybe get an inch or two. We finally got him to the edge, and then... We hoped that he would just slide down this, um, this, into this little ravine. Well, he didn't, and so we had to push him. It took us a half an hour to get that horse all the way down to the bottom of that place, and we were sweating, and, um, and you know, but we finally got him down there, and we, ah, whew, and so we made our way back up the bank, which took another five minutes, because it was so icy, and um, we got up there, and our hearts sank. Because a battleship would have been no less obvious out there in this in this snowy area, you know. And so we looked down there and we realized our job is not over. And because we knew, for one thing, whenever um, a school bus uh, and the school bus would go by, the kids out in the country were all these introspective kids, and they would stare out the school bus windows. Whenever you would see them, they'd be standing on their seats, looking out the windows. And we knew that this would never fool anybody. That the first thing that they, hey Gretchen, there's your horse, you know. Oh, so. Um, <clears throat> So I said to Jim, what should we do? He says, well, think we could burn him? <laughs> oh, no. And I had already thought of that, but I, I, wouldn't, I didn't want to say it. And he said, you got any kerosene? And I, I got tons of kerosene. That's how we have our lights, you know. So we go up to the house, get my five-gallon can of kerosene, come back to Brownie, saturate the horse, with this kerosene, and we're pitching matches at him, you know. <laughs> and finally, one catches in his fur, and, and the, it starts to burn. And after a while, the entire horse is engaged in flame, and it's this macabre scene of this God. flame, you know, flying the horse's head coming in, the ah. arm coming out. And, <clears throat> I'm just trying to create a scene here, you know. <laughs> Good visual. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and he was going, ah. no, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but you know, after a while we realize this is kind of nice out here. And we've got this enormous campfire burning down here. The, the heat is coming up the, the side of the ravine. Um, and the sun is shining above us. And you know, it was 20 degrees with the sun and the heat. It, it was very pleasant. I said, why don't I go get a couple of chairs? <laughs> so I, I drive over to my house. I get a couple of lawn chairs, come back. I've got a six pack of beer. And Jim goes, all right. <laughs> and so we sat there, the both of us sitting uh, in, 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 you know, in the fire. Huh? The three with the horse. Well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and um, so we're sitting there and it's very pleasant. Well, further down the road, there's another farm. And there's a guy named Homer who lives there and, um, with his family. 
and you can easily see the, it's about maybe a half a mile away, and you can easily see his farm, and he's got a rickety road that goes along. Well, here comes his pickup truck down the road, mm -hmm. and he always turned the other way to go down into town. He was not a friendly, uh, you know, an outgoing kind of guy. But this time, he pulled up this way toward us, and we can see his pickup truck coming up the road, and he pulls up next to us, and he puts his arm out on the window, and he says, boys, and I, hey, Homer, you know, he says, uh, what you doing? Burning a horse? <laughs> Died on you? Yeah, yeah, we're having a beer, you want one? Well, I believe I will. And <laughs> so he, he maneuvers his pickup truck, backs up, and gets the tailgate right next to where we were. Uh -huh. And the three of us are sitting there now, and now uh, we give him a beer, and he's enjoying the beer, and it's a beautiful sunny day, and the hour, uh, at least an hour or two go by. We look down at the horse again, realize that it, it, you could still tell that it was clearly a horse, so we were to saturate him again, <laughs> the fire's going. Mm -hmm. And um, Homer, um, you know, he, he's a guy that I had met on a number of occasions, and, and he had that kind of natural pessimism um, that comes with <laughs> these guys that, that um, have to try to, you know, get a living out of this, out of this cold, hard earth, you know, and, yeah. um, you know, I'd say to him, man, looks like you got a great crop of alfalfa this year, and he goes, ah, lots of weeds in there, you know, <clears throat> and I, God, that's, I love your new horse, uh, he'll probably lay him up on me in no time, you know, <laughs> yeah. and, um, and, <laughs> and so, um, and I, I remember Jim even said to him, isn't it a beautiful day today, and he says, ah, oh, we'll probably have a storm later, you know, <laughs> and, um, but he started talking to us, and um, I had heard rumors that um, a couple of his sons had died on the farm. And, um, and he started, after a while, after a beer or two, he started, he started to talk to us about these things. And one son had died a long time before in a tractor accident, which is not that unusual on a, on a farm. Uh, all this uneven earth, and, and it, but it fell right on top of his son, who was driving the tractor, and crushed him, crushed his chest. And then the other one was, was this really terrifying, horrifying thing where um, the family had gone into lunch uh, and the one boy had stayed out with this enormous open-mouthed hay shredder and the boy had fallen into the hay shredder. Oh. Um, and Homer and his sons came back out and found bits of the oh, song. Shit. I mean, it was really this terror. And by this time when he was talking to us, he was talking like this. You know, he says, well, and we walked back out there after lunch and... And, um, you know, and I saw this, this scene, and he's trying to describe the scene to us, and I, I could see the, the weight of this experience in his face. And, and I remember thinking even, I, I wonder how he could ever live through that, because he f clearly felt guilt about it, you know, and I wondered if he'd even maybe considered suicide. How do you live through that kind of thing? And did he have love left over for the rest of his family? Because there was still a, a couple sons and a daughter at home, and... But, you know, I felt so deeply for him. And um, because, you know, it was, for me, the theme of the day kind of was fathers. And, you know, I had seen Jim with his daughter Gretchen and his care for her. And, and here's Homer talking about the death of his two sons. And, and I was really moved by it. And, and all of us were. And we were sitting there and we just kept drinking beer. After a while, the fire went down and, and we didn't really need, it was clear that the, the horse, it was not a horse. And, um, but the three of us were sitting there in this warm sun, and, and we didn't really want to leave. It was, it was really a, a, a beautiful scene, you know? And then finally, over time, um, Homer had to leave, and, and he had had a few beers, and his truck was gone, and I could just see the scorn on his wife's face when he walked into the <laughs> kitchen, you know? And been drinking with them boys up there, and... Um, but, you know, um, <clears throat> we finished up the job, and... I went back up to my house and, and poured ourselves a whiskey, and Jim and I sat there for a while, and, and finally the girls came back from school in the school bus, and, and he walked out into the yard, and I could see him talking to the girls, and, and Gretchen immediately sobbing. And, um, and I was just, again, I was just so moved, because I wondered, would my dad have that kind of feeling for me? You know, if I had that sort of loss in my life, what would my dad's reaction be? Would he... Would he keep it all inside, unlike Jim, because Jim was crying with his daughter, and uh, yeah, I was just so, I, I was envious. I wish that I had had a father like that, you know? And um, so they finally went home, and I was left by myself again, and, and sure enough, Homer was right. And, and the clouds started coming in, and it was going to be a cold night. Um, I went into my little room, which was about the size of this room here, um, 
I had isolated it in the house, and I had a pot belly stove in this room, and uh, a sleeping loft with a couple of cats, and my kerosene lamps. And I remember rather than reading that night, I, I laid down on my bed, and it was late evening, and I had one kerosene lamp going. It took three to really read. And I'm just lying there thinking of, of this experience that I had had during the day and the image of the three of us out there in the sun and um, this shared thing among the men, you know, and it was this lovely memory. And I remember wishing that I could call my dad, that he was still alive living in Florida, and um, feeling the need even to talk to him and to uh, hear about maybe some of his experiences and what had formed him, because it was so clear to me what had formed these other men. Mm. Um, so I, but with those thoughts, you know, and I, and I, and I thought, you know, I'm kind of discounting this man, this, this father of mine, because he really was kind, and people felt good around him because of his kindness, and old ladies loved him because it always opened the door for them and, and all this, and, and I realized that had I had something like that, and, my, and I had a horse, I, I really do, I did come to the belief that I was lying there that my dad would have held me and, and would have it really expressed something for me. And I gave him some slack, in other words. And I think maybe seeing the example of these other men had softened my feelings toward my dad. And so I eventually fell asleep, and a few hours later, um, I woke up, and the blizzard, and the house was shaking from this blizzard, and, but I felt safe inside my bag and the two cats next to me, and I turned off my kerosene lamp, and I went to sleep. Mm -hmm.